Welcome to the Act and Unwind podcast, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate to the show notes for this episode to find a link to where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else that you find fine podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find this show. This week, I'm joined by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and research associate, and Michael Matheson-Miller, senior research fellow here at Acton. Today, we're going to be discussing all things national conservatism because Dan just got back from the National Conservative II conference in Orlando, Florida. And perhaps to, by way of intro here, let's just kick it to you, Dan, to tell us what did you see, what did you hear, what did you experience at NatCon 2? I saw a whole lot. Um, This was a gathering that had many, many speakers, um, many, many sessions. So the typical day would look like four speakers in the morning, uh, before the whole uh, before the whole audience breakout sessions that usually involve four speakers, then further afternoon plenaries with four speakers, and then further breakout sessions with four speakers, and um, and then concluding with with a dinner with at least with at least two, sometimes four, uh, sometimes three keynotes. So. A lot of voices and a lot of voices um, that were very different on very different things. There were some speeches that, you know, you would think they were straight out of, you know, 1984 sort of Reaganism, other speeches bewailing uh, that sort of circa 1984 Reaganism. You had some speeches extolling the virtues of innovation in the private sector, others bewailing the dominance of the private sector. So it's a really, uh, it's a whole great big mashup. And I think in Yoram Hazoni's remarks, he sort of encapsulated why that might be, because he talked about national conservatism being both an ideological movement and a political movement, and that those things weren't necessarily the same. And he, uh, sort of a consistent theme throughout the con- conference was the need for political allies, um, for sort of non Marxian liberals to join with national conservatives, uh, electing candidates, um, which I don't, which is a message that I don't think all the speakers got because some of them were still, uh, very much on the war path against libertarians against sort of center-right folks, and and definitely the left as a whole. Is there anything that somewhat coherently knitted this all together? I mean, you hear a lot from what you said there, you know, a lot of different threads, especially, you know, the kind of pro-Reaganism stuff is not exactly what I would fully be expecting to hear at this kind of conference. Uh, But but was there any coherent thread or uh, idea that ran through the entire conference? Or is it really, you know, different groups of voices all just kind of thrown into a blender here and put on stage? The coherence is the brand. Um, And this is very self-conscious among a lot of the speakers, is specifically using whatever they were talking about and framing it in terms of national conservatism. You saw this in Chris DeMuth's talk where he invoked by turns Michael Novak and then concluded with a quote from Adam Smith on the subject of why he's a national conservative. So Michael Novak is someone who is very much behind um, sort of the original vision of the Acton Institute, his spirit of democratic capitalism, talked about the importance of markets, individual rights, democracy. Um, and those things, those things, uh, you know, are part of what, you know, Adam Smith would call earlier his system of natural liberty. What that's traditionally been known as outside of sort of an American political context is liberalism. Um, this is, you know, 
a political movement, a longstanding political movement that I think a lot of the speakers were ignorant about. And there's a lot of conflicting definitions of liberalism, but an almost universal decrying of liberalism, while at the same time, there are some folks putting forward essentially a vision of a liberal society. Um, You've got other folks, uh, Josh Hammer's address, Josh Hammer from Newsweek was very critical of liberalism in general, of what he referred to uh, as conservatism, Inc., in particular, the sort of dominant um, intellectual structure of the American right. Um, so the, but, but the brand was startlingly consistent with, you had, you had folks invoking this, um, you had Glenn Lowry making a case, actually the title of his talk, uh, which is a wonderful talk, the opening night was uh, the case for black patriotism. But in the talk itself, he used the language of nationalism to do that same sort of thing. So there's definitely um, there's definitely a rhetorical continuity, although the ideas underlying that continuity, uh, uh, the ideas themselves are very disparate. Is there a consensus around, to me, this has been somewhat confounding from the beginning, is nailing down a definition of, of what they mean by nationalism. You, you had, of course, Yoram Hazoni has a book on the virtue of nationalism. You had uh, Rich Lowry from National Review who had uh, a book about nationalism. And as I have listened to and, and read these people, um, I have a hard time nailing down exactly what I think they mean in a lot of cases, and that from Hazoni, what I hear often is he seems to be, to me, to be defending the idea of, you know, that the nation state is the best building block for society as opposed to, I suppose, something smaller than that or a one world government. And to which I would say, yes, I'm entirely in agreement with him on that. Um, But to me, that's not what nationalism is, and that doesn't reflect the history of nationalist movements in different countries, that um, I have a harder time nailing down why they're, why we focused on nationalism um, and why, well, I guess a lot of the terminology that gets thrown around seems somewhat ill-defined to me. I heard uh, Hazoni's speech. I didn't attend the conference. Uh, it would have been interesting, but I, I wasn't able to go. Um, but... I he defined a na- the nation Yaram did uh, three with three things he said it's independence cohesion and tradition those are his three definitions so independence I think as you uh, articulate Eric is really a reaction against globalism right a certain kind of global secularism which I'm a, a big critic of so I I, I think that's he, and he's he's talking about the importance of the nation state here he talked about you know he started <clears throat> early in uh, Yaram did and Hazoni did in his talk kind of talking about how he grew up as a Reagan conservative, influenced by Irving Kristol and, and the, the kind of the neocon movement, and then made the distinction about the neocon movement shifted. And I thought that was, I mean, I thought that was right, because in one sense, neocon is also, they're not clear about liberalism, they're not clear about neocons, exactly what do we mean? You know, neocon used to mean someone who, in Kristol's term, was mugged by reality, right? So somebody who had been on the left and then had come over to the right. So um, by definition, I'm not a neocon because I was never on the left, right? And then neocon became, like, okay, a certain type of like Straussian outlook and then George Bush and then a certain globalist outlook. So the, these things have changed through through time. But he said, he said that, essentially that the conservative movement had embraced what George H.W. Bush called the New World Order and Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, and this kind of global way of seeing the world and open borders and uh, free trade and all of these things. And he's found that the, those things were put above the priority and the value of the nation. So that he, the idea of independence kind of in the, in the Brexit way of getting out of the European Union in these global courts. Second thing he said was cohesion. And here he talked about, you know, America right now is highly fragmented. Uh, and it's interesting, he actually used Mill as one of his examples, I don't remember this, Dan, for cohesion. He's, you know, a liberal uh, uh, where there was this idea of mutual loyalty and that we need to be able to see ourselves as a integrated whole uh, to 
to be able to say, respect democratic elections, right? And that right now we're in a time of fraying. And again, he went back a lot to immigration and to borders. Like we can't be letting a lot of people in when we're fraying. And then the last one he talked about was tradition. And tradition is that we've lost our tradition. We've lost what is sacred and honorable and that the key keystone concepts of what made America uh, America from Anglo common law to constitutional tradition to the English language to scripture uh, and the Christian tradition uh, have all been lost and that conservatives, he argued, focus too much on privatizing, especially Meyer, privatizing religion and thinking we'd stay reasonable. And so echoing Solzhenitsyn, you know, he says, you know, uh, when you throw out God, people can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. Uh, so those were the three things that he set out, independence, cohesion, and tradition. Uh, so we can talk about that. One of the things I'd like to ask both of you as I, as I think about, uh, well, I'll just throw it out, we can talk about it in detail, but sometimes it, it's, it's interesting like who their enemies are or what the situation is or how they're some, in some ways radically different from a lot of conservatives who all hold those positions but wouldn't call themselves NatCons. So I think that that's maybe, Dan, you can, you can explain that. But that, but that is, I tried to do the best I could to represent what Yarum articulated as the three parts of what he means by the nation. I think, I think Michael, Michael's very right on Yoram's reading. The question is, is Yoram's reading the crowd's reading? Um, and, and not just the crowd as the attendees, but the crowd as the speakers and the, and the crowd as those folks who are, are sort of self-identifying as national conservatives um, one of the things that struck me is that you really, at, at the basic level, and I think there was another speaker that contrasted it in this way, that they're nationalists in the sense that they're not internationalists. That yeah, I heard that too. There is a problem with sort of these transnational institutions, be they the United Nations, a lot of um, the sort of international movements, uh, both cultural and political, such as, you know, the whole sort of climate change movement is something that folks are skeptical of. But even, even here, like I, I attended an excellent um, breakout session uh, the second day of the conference that featured Richard Reinch um, of Law and Liberty uh, Jay Richards, formerly of the Acton Institute, uh, now with Heritage, uh, David Rose and Diana Roth. And they were basically of a consensus that free trade is basically good, that there might be issues of reciprocity. You had Ted Cruz talking about in his talk that protectionism is not the answer. Um, so even these things in terms of the free flow of capital and labor is something that there doesn't seem to be cohesion about. Um, what there is cohesion about is a general sort of suspicion of international institutions. Although, you know, from Chris Rufo's talk, you have a suspicion of national institutions. You know, he closed his talk with uh, talking about how America's institutions no longer serve American interests. So it's it's a very complicated thing what it is this nation that these folks are rallied around because a lot of them see the nation itself or the nation's institutions themselves as things that are eroding the nation. Or the regime, right? That's how they talk about it. Like the Claremont would say like the re the current regime is anti-American almost. That's some of the, the language, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess one of the things that I'm wondering since, Dan, you had said that Hizoni defined this as being both in you know an ideological movement and a political movement, and it seems to me that for at least one of those, um, you know, you can put together a political mov movement that has ideological incoherence within it. And you, it's a political movement. You're balancing certain interests, especially if you're going to have you know basically interest group building kind of politics, which is the way that the right has largely been moving. We've That's been, fusionism. They've been, they've been well. They've also been flip flopping with um, traditionally with the left, which was for a good long while there. By my lights, the right was primarily ideologically driven as a political movement. And the left was coalitionally driven. And now, especially as you've seen the swapping of political bases over the last 30 to 40 years, um, you're seeing more coalitional politics on the right and I think more ideological politics on the left. But 
you can you can have that kind of incoherence and things that are in tension. You know, it, it, in the same way that if you rewind to like the New Deal coalition, I mean, what sense did it make that you would have, you know, um, you know, radical black Marxist activists in New York City in the same coalition with, you know, un- Rust Belt union laborers um, or South- the Southern Democrats that uh, existed at the time? You can have those kinds of tensions, but as an ideological movement to have the you know, uh, I'm I'm pleased to hear some of the dissents from the things that I have problems with in the national conservative movement that you just talked about, Dan. But it seems that uh, that the ideological part of it to me is incredibly confused in that you've got people saying a whole bunch of different things that I don't know that they can possibly exist together. I think it's a I think it's a political movement in search of an ideology. Um, there is, I think, a sort of universal desire to break with the past, um, what those problems are with the past of the American right are different for different folks, but they are interested in building something new. Um, what was very interesting, one of the interesting things, again, you know, from an acting perspective is the religion was very general. Um, it was a very sort of American civic religion, uh, almost sort of an, just a simply a simply sort of natural law religion, which is which is good, but it's not grounded in any sort of concrete theological tradition. It's not grounded in any sort of theologically rich anthropology. Um, what what it's grounded on is is a sort of developing sensibility. Um, and an uneasiness with American secularism, or at least some of its excesses. Um, so you've got you've got things like that. You've also got uh, politics is very much in the forefront. There's a lot of discussions, a lot of assumptions of the speakers that the audience are all Republicans, and that the success of the Republican Party is the success of the of the movement. Um, we had the final day of the conference. The returns from Virginia were coming in. People were very excited about this. Um, people saw this as as a positive development for the movement. Um, and in that sense, it seems it seems it seems the political is 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 the lead here. But um, I think what's interesting about that to me is it, it seems like they're looking at that as a Rorschach test and they're seeing in it what they want to see. Because as I look at what happened in Virginia, you have a relatively traditional in the kind of American conservative political tradition sense, Republican candidate for governor of Virginia, um, who is not somebody who is clearly of this new national conservative movement or even all that Trumpy. He was endorsed by Donald Trump, but you know, kind of famously distanced himself from Trump to the best extent that he could. Trump did not involve himself in the race. And he seized on a local issue that I think is also being reduced by a lot of people who have an interest in reducing it in terms of education, that it wasn't to me just, you know, I'm sure Chris Rufo is taking sole responsibility for winning the Virginia election, but I don't think that that's accurate because you also, in a lot of those counties, had schools that had been closed for really the entirety of the last school year because of the power of the teachers union. You had uh, a Democrat candidate in Terry McAuliffe. Uh, who said in a debate, in one of those, you can debate whether it's a gaffe or a Kinsley gaffe or whether he just said what he actually believes and what a lot of people who are supporting him believe, that we don't. he doesn't think that parents should be telling schools and teachers what they should be teaching. He successfully, Yunkin, successfully seized on a political issue, but he's not you know, a clear representative of what I believe can discern as the political movement of this kind of national conservatism. So to me, it looks a lot like a Rorschach test from their point of view, that they're seeing the success of a very generic Republican, and they are trying to do their best to you know, show up at the beginning of the parade and to mix metaphors here and frame it in the best possible way to say that this is clearly a show of victory for this kind of a movement. Am I, am I wrong in this? I'm going to leave that to Dan. That's- I mean, I I think I think you're right. I think I think what they would they would say, and this is I mean, I in my mind the most interesting speech was Rufo's speech. 
and part of it is because he framed it in ways that at least the national conservative movement as it was getting off was very um, self-consciously not. Um, he talked about how sort of the nature of the political conflict is cultural and not economic. And this is one of those things I noticed. I sent, I sat in on a uh, session on worker power and the sort of energy was over issues of race and culture and it was not over the sort of policy wonk, okay, how can we, uh, I mean, there were certainly, there were, you know, great speakers at that session who were very informative. There were people there, but the people weren't consumed with issues of like, how can we regenerate the American working class? How can we, you know, here's, here's my 10 step industrial policy, um, this really wasn't the center of the conference. The center of the conference was the sort of cultural issues, um, particularly uh, critical race theory, particularly um, these sort of uh, LGBTQ issues. Those were sort of like the red meat issues that got people excited and engaged and it wasn't, and and I think, and I think, and I think Rufo has his pulse on that um, in a sort of fairly unique way. Um, but then it's interesting how he extends those arguments that what this cultural fight is about. He talked about it being the fundamental rights of parents to en- educate their children, which is a very sort of liberal understanding of education. Um, and he talked about um, it was very much more of an antagonistic. It wasn't a it wasn't a call to capture the state bureaucracy for new ends, but to sort of lay siege to those institutions. And it was an argument more for an exit from those institutions than it was to have a voice within those institutions, which strikes me as is very different from the sort of national conservatism we saw on display the last time they had this conference. A couple of things stand out, Dan, you said. One is just, I think the exit voice is an interesting one because, you know, I've talked about this before as well, that part of the reason you exit is to build new associations so that you can have a voice, which is, as you point out, is different from one of the themes of of a certain nat con theme, which is to capture the administrative state. And I, I mean, I think that's, I, that's one of my critiques of the national conservative movement is this idea that they're somehow going to capture the administrative state. I mean, I just think that's Dungeons and Dragons. I don't think it's going to happen. And, and, um, and I don't think it's, so I think the idea of exit and building associations, uh, is, is a, a much better way to do that building institutions. But let, let me go to something you said earlier and, and we can debate that if you want to debate that uh, with me. Um, but, <clears throat> um, you, you use the word a sensibility. And I think that that's, I think something that there is a sensibility in the national conservative movement. So like when I hear like some parts of the NatCon people speak, I, I like what they're saying. I agree. And then I said like, wait, then they kind of all of a sudden talk about, oh, we're going to take over the administrative state or you get integralists involved or, uh, you know, you have kind of Pat Deneen that the American founding is fundamentally corrupt. It's totally depraved, right? It's a Calvinist reading of the American founding. Uh, and then you have Yara Mazzoni invoking the Anglo-American tradition, right? So it's it, a lot of, I think you you point out, there's a lot of things that are unclear. You know, uh, people like Sorba Mari and others are very critical of, of liberalism, right? But it's, un- and I'm writing an essay on this now, like I, I'm not sure what he means by liberalism. Like what, what do you mean by that? And it's hard to kind of pin things down. So I think it goes back to your point of sensibility. And, and this is, um, <clears throat> I gave a talk at the Philadelphia Society on conservatism that um, our colleague Sam Gregg uh, organized when he was president of Philadelphia Society. And it was a very interesting conference with a lot of people debating uh, conservative positions. And um, <clears throat> one argument that, I, one of the arguments I made was I think that What's led to this real division and debate, you know, you, there's this sense of Hazoni said this and Josh Hammer and others like we're declaring independence from neoconservatism. And I think there's this sense of frustration. Like we've had 70 years of a conservative movement that electoral victories on the national, st- state, local, presidential level, judicial appointments and et cetera, think tanks, journals. 
But in one another sense, we've completely lost the culture, right? So we've lost marriage, family, education, transgenderism, woke capitalism, what, right? And that there's a sense we ask ourselves like, how are we different from anybody else, right? So there's this uh, this Polish film called Katyn that I, that I like. Uh, it's a very powerful film. Um, but at one of the conversations, uh, uh, the woman says, okay, you think differently, but how do you act differently, right? And, and I don't want to overstate this because I think there are a lot of good things going on, you know, a lot of good organizations. But I mean, we're in this time of big government, big state, big tech, big culture, big media. And there's a sense like, the conservative leadership has done nothing to solve this problem, right? Um, now, I think that Hazoni, I mean, I think, and, and so I think that's the sensibility. Like, we've got to be like radical and we've got to do something. You know, I, I was talking to actually one of the guys who's uh, in the NatCon movement and uh, we had a nice conversation. And I said, one of the things the problems is, I think you're getting a lot of the things right about the problems we have, but you have, you have Thumos without prudence. It's just like, we're just going to do stuff, you know? And I, and I think this is, you know, you were there, Dan. So you, this is where I think there's a lot, people are trying to figure out what's going on right now. And I would say, you know, we could talk about some critiques of different parts, like, are they liberal? Are they anti-liberal? Do they want an industrial policy, which is kind of like a Keynesianism? Like, what, like, do you really want the state to run big corporations and have crony capitalism or do you want strong towns and 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 you know uh vibrant communities well you need free competitive market economies for those so like there, i think there's just a lot of confusion uh go, going on there um but but it, one of the things it seems to me is i sometimes wonder like who they're they're like almost like the enemies are they're con they, they also use this punish your enemy stuff, which I think is problematic, but there's almost like a confusion about who are you going after? Like, are you going after the left and libertarians? Like what kind of libertarians? Like beltway libertarians who are, who are supporting say, you know, homosexual marriage and transgenderism. Okay, that's a small group. What about like Austrians who believe in sound money? And have a very conservative idea of low time preference. I mean, like it seems, or even to me, just the, the kind of cultural libertarianism that exists throughout the American ethos that you see represented in the uh, rejection of vaccine mandates is where I see it the most clearly. Sure. Is that like the, you have people who will simultaneously be willing to say the vaccine is good and you should get it, and I've gotten it, but I'm opposed to the idea of you coming in and telling yeah. me that you must do this. Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, like, so they think that's good, Eric. You point out, I think there's two things. So like, you have that whether they're like. Austrian school, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> free market types who want sound money and who want to, you know, build long-term civilizational, you know, d developments, which would align with NatCon and some of the things Hazoni says. And then you've got like the vaccine, like resistance, a certain sense, like that we need to have a limited state. And at the same time, those people are almost the enemies. And then we need a big industrial policy where we're going to direct the economy you know, towards these goals. Well, number one, that's what we've been doing. <laughs> that's what Davos capitalism is. That's what, that's what global liberalism is. Like, so, so it's, it, it seems to me, Dan, this is a more of a question. When I hear um, them talk, it's like, and this is a, this will be a little bit harsh and, and I don't think it applies to everybody, but there's almost like, let's say things that are really provocative to start Twitter wars and to get people worked up. Uh, and, and they're not like, who, What's the coalition that they're going to build? Because I'll tell you this, like, for example, so I, as I said earlier, I, I met, I know some of the NatCon people. I like them. Okay. I, you see people on the NatCon team, some of their leaders who are like the Acton Institute's, a bunch of libertarians and everything. And then, then they say things like, you know, we really need to take anthropology seriously. Well, yeah. I mean, what do you think we've been doing here? I mean, why don't you come to Acton University and listen to my lecture or Sam's lecture on anthropology? And it's a rejection of radical liberalism and all these things. And meanwhile, we're like the enemy because we think that some parts of society are appropriate where there's commutative justice, meaning some things should be done on markets. I, I should, as I've talked about before, just because I think we should be able to buy cabbage and, uh, uh, you know, whiskey and an iPhone on commutative justice in exchange doesn't mean I should treat my eight-year-old with commutative justice. I need to treat her with distributive justice. And just because I think that we, we can have some economic exchange uh, free 
and regular, un, generally unregulated, doesn't mean that I don't think that there's a need for rule of law and private property and all these institutions. Or it also doesn't mean that because I think some things can be done on a free market that we should be able to sell organs or people, right? And and there's like the a lot of this work, I guess what I'm trying to say, has been done, not just at the Act Institute, but by lots of people. You mentioned Michael Novak, have worked out the distinctions of what a limited state, what a free market economy looks like. And it appears that the way the NatCons speak, it's as if they haven't thought about, like, it's like, like, it, wait, has no one thought about this before? And people have been thinking about this for a long time, whether it's John Paul II or Solzhenitsyn or Benedict XVI or, or a lot of the conservative thinkers in the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. I mean, these things have been wrestled with. They're complex. And the way I hear sometimes the NatCon speaking is just like, nobody's thought about this before. Everybody's a libertarian. And I'm th- a little confused. So yeah, Dan, am I, I misreading I, that or what? Dan? When we were talking about this, I made a similar point to you as well. The one of the things that kind of annoys me about some of these conversations is, especially uh, from the younger group of people who have attached themselves to this movement, to think that this is all original and this is all new and it has never happened before as if, you know, triumph in the 1970s and Brent Bazell never existed. And we haven't had these arguments before. There seems to be a ignorance to history while at the same time, this um, just absolute proclamation of love for tradition. And it seems to me that they don't even fully understand or know their own history and tradition. Well, part of building a brand is product differentiation. And I think a lot of the folks... <clears throat> You know, I, I I don't want to attribute too much to either ignorance or malice. And while I think I think Michael's right, like all of all of these debates have happened before. I mean, Frank Meyer, Frank Meyer's argument is not as Sazoni characterized it as a sort of like private conservatism and public liberalism. It is that freedom is necessary for virtue that for an action to be virtuous, it has to be free. Now, what Hazoni is trying to get at is to sort of, is, is I don't think like a faithful intellectual picture of Frank Meyer. I think what he's trying to get at is, okay, what people are often frustrated with on the right is that there seems to be, you know, a sort of privatization of the good. So how do I set myself up is offering a solution to that problem. And one of the ways you do it, one of the ways you differentiate your product is you caricature and you devalue and you dismiss the others. Um, and I don't think that sounds much more malicious than I think it is. I think this is part of the nature of being an intellectual entrepreneur. And you can see it throughout the history of the American right. You have Bill Buckley devaluing and dismissing people to build a consensus around National Review. You have, uh, folks like Murray Rothbard doing very much the same sort of thing. And this is because this is, I think, primarily a political movement. And this is a, a question of sort of like this ideological stuff is as much about sorting who's in or who's out than it is about any sort of uh, coherent is, – is more about that than any sort of advancing a sort of coherent ideological position. This is about um, un- creating a new set of institutions and a new set of leaders for the American right. And these are folks that are interested in that project. You talked about President Trump earlier. There wasn't – a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of people who supported President Trump. There were not a lot of folks who wholeheartedly endorsed him. These were folks that thought that President Trump uh, demonstrated the viability of an alternative sort of politics on the right and now would like a place at that table at reorganizing what that would look like. You know, a couple of things also, I think, really, like how, how, 
I, I, I'm focusing on Yaram because he's really the founder, and also I, that's the one I know. That's the speech I heard the most. But he he kind of lays it out right. And early on <clears throat> in his talk, he says he talks about how you know there was Reagan conservatives I talked about earlier, and how people like. George H. W. Bush talked about a new world order and the end of history and everything. And then he and he and he says that he says that what happened was methodological individualism of of free marketers invaded politics, and that everybody reduced it to that. And I don't think he's totally wrong, but I do think he. I think I would I would phrase it differently, and I I I have phrased it differently uh, over the years. That and I gave a talk in two thousand seven here at the Acton Institute called the Victory of Socialism. And uh, I said in, in that, and I think it, it still holds that I've thought about it o- over time, that what happened was <clears throat> the right misidentified or reduced a lot of the Soviet threat to an economic threat. And when we won the Cold War, we thought, okay, socialism is dead. And then you had this switch, this shift, you know, like Clinton Democrats, new labor, everybody was like pro-market, but it wasn't exactly pro-market. It was really kind of a, man, a managed capitalist stuff, but a lot of pro-market stuff, liberalism. And, and conservatives kind of took it easy, like we won. And so when Clinton and Blair were talking about free markets, I was like, yeah, free market's great. But what happened was that the long march through the institutions of culture, to use Gramsci's language, continued. And in a sense, I think conservatives were a, a, a little bit asleep at the wheel. So Augusto Del Noche in 1989, he said, look, Mar- right before he died, Marxism failed in the East because it realized itself in the West. People like Solzhenitsyn said, look, the West is being infected here. Joseph Ratzinger, later Benedict XVI, uh, said that Marxism was only the radical execution of the, of the spirit of our age. And so what, we ha- what happened is, in a sense, conservatives kind of rejoiced, like, hey, things are great. We're, we're free, free, uh, we have freedom. Everything's working. But, but meanwhile, the culture became further and further left anti-American, but just not just anti-American, but anti-Western in many ways, with uh, at least in that Marxian way of anti-Western. And so now we're reaping this and everybody's freaked out, which I, I mean, I, I get. Um, but I, I think, I think that, I think that's, I think that's where a lot of the energy is coming from. And so I think, and the, and the critique is like, uh, understandably, conservative Inc., you know, failed to see this. The people who are in leadership allowed, were asleep and allowed this to come through. And now we've got to do something about it. That seems to be one of the, the strong things. And I agree, last thing I'll say is with, with Dan, that there's an intellectual entrepreneurship going, because I do think a lot of what they're doing is like, in a sense, trying to set themselves apart by kind of picking fights. And the question is, is that, is that a long-term beneficial strategy? I mean, do you want to really alienate people like me <laughs> who, who, right? I mean, I'm, at times- It's not great for political coalition building. But, and so <laughs> it's funny because in a sense, they want to be new fusionists. But, but, but Sora Bamari just wrote like, okay, we'll work with, you know, people on the left uh, who, who d- don't like economic liberty. Like, I, I mean, I don't want to, exa- that's not maybe an exact quote, but it's something like people on the left who, who are, you know, critical of kind of this market fundamentalism will work with them. But that seems to like miss the point. Like those are very much the people that are are also part of this cultural uh, uh, disintegration that they're so that they're so worried about. I mean, what what do you think about that? Well, I I think my greatest point of skepticism with regard to this movement, especially as Dan has made the point here, that it you know Hazoni says that it's an uh, uh, intellectual and ideological movement as well as a political movement. <clears throat> I think it is primarily a political movement. And I, I'm skeptical of the ability of this political movement to accomplish the ends that it is articulating through politics. Or through a large a, state, actually. Or, or, well, and, and through a large state, which I, I, I'll i get to that in a second. But I, I think just in generally through politics that it is going to be able to accomplish the ends that is proclaiming, at least if it is going to hew to some of the values and the virtues that I think they claim to have. So you talked earlier about you know the, the institutions, and I, I would separate out something like the administrative state from uh, – because I agree with you. I don't think there's a chance that you know people thinking within you know 10 degrees of the way that we think or the national conservatives think are ever going to uh, – capture the administrative state. And there could be a political project to limit the size and scope and influence of the administrative state, which is something I would happily sign on to. But 
for me that some of the cultural stuff that you talked about, Michael, to me, I see a project of it's not that there was a battle that was fought there and it was lost as much as conservatives and people on the right seeded the battlefield and they just they withdraw. So you instead of having a concerted effort to get more conservatives into and on the faculty of Harvard University. We create institutions like Hillsdale. So we're almost operating like monks, right? That in that it's important that we have these, you know, small enclaves where, you know, it's entirely uh, focused around a belief system that we are copacetic with that, you know, hopefully when, uh, you know, if you, you t- take this as like a political version of Rod Dreher's Benedict option, right, that, you know, you're going to let everything out there play out and collapse. And then we have educated people within these small enclaves. I, I think we would have done a lot better by trying to make a concerted focus on getting more people who are of the right into the student body of Harvard. And on the faculty of Harvard, that's not to say it wouldn't be a fight and there wouldn't be resistance to that. But if we've been working on this project for a longer period of time, I think we would not be in the current state that we are now. You can say the same thing about journalism. You can say the same thing about education. You know, it, it just it strikes me that a lot of those areas of study within universities, and this is anecdotal experience in, in my own right, from my time at a, you know, American university, the people who were interested in going in into those kinds of fields were already oriented to the left. Mm -hmm. And people who were inclined to the right went into business and finance and and, uh, other fields like that and did not want to go into education or some of these other things. And then, you know, surprise and shock when we've only had people largely of the left going into institutions like that, they become to be dominant, the dominant view of those institutions. My question is just, I don't think these are necessarily all things that can get settled out politically. And to your point, Michael, certainly not on a national level. The idea that there is some kind of national policy regime that is going to fix the problems in American education, that is going to fix a lot of the things that you've articulated. I just don't see that happening, especially since there seems to be some kind of a, and if you'll pardon the South Park reference, an underpants gnome strategy to a lot of this stuff where it's, you know, they they have the idea, they've identified this incredible problem and the culture and all of that. Step two is, uh, and step three is we've seized the levels of power and now we control everything and can orient the state to the, the greater good or the, um, the the greatest good, to the common good. I just don't see the political salience of this project. I think there are things you can do at a national level, but part of my objection to it as well in orienting it towards a national level by the nature of it being national conservatism is that we cannot solve all of these problems there and that we shouldn't be trying to solve all of these problems there. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think those, you raise a lot of good points. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what they would say that because I think some people would probably agree with you on the NatCon thing. This goes to Dan's point. Right. That there's it's not there's a lot of debate going on. Um, I mean, I, let me just a couple things. I, and I could be wrong. So I'm happy to, you know, if a listener tells me I'm wrong, I'm happy to be wrong. But it seems to me like Robbie George tried to do what you said at Princeton, you know, trying to be involved in like in the, the and you'll see even national conservative kind of young, young conservatives criticizing him as somehow like weak. Well, he, he you know, he's trying to because he's trying to have debate and discussion. So uh, it's it's well, hard. Now the orientation seems to be that anybody who is a part of those old institutions that they heap nothing but scorn on is a part of the problem because they've just in some way acquiesced to the institution by agreeing to participate in it. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, I think you just raise a lot of, it's a, a lot of issues that are, they're going to take time to work out. So I guess I would say this, you know, it, there's a lot, we don't have that much time. And you raised a, a lot of really important issues about culture and how to think about the state and how to think about the role of the state. And I, I guess what I would say is the good thing that the national conservative movement is doing is raising some of these issues. The thing I guess I'm less enthusiastic about is some of the tone in which they're raising it as if, um, you know, it's it's they're trying to build a coalition while like in a sense, you know, having this incoherent but strong ideological test of what you know whether you're part of the team or not and any question that you ask to them somehow makes you oh well, you're just really not part of the team you're part of the old guard i i sense those two things happening at the same time and yeah you know like i said i know some people in the national Conservative; they're nice people like i mean we agree on almost on most things right and so i i think maybe it goes to the question of how can it seems like we can build a better coalition without the kind of like you know 
strong spiritedness that just like trying to pushes everybody out of me. I'm glad. Look, look, we're in a serious, in a serious anthropological debate, and that they're right about. You, I think the mistake also we made is we didn't just we 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 were asleep, as you said. We we allowed a lot of bad stuff to kind of slowly make its way into being institutionalized. And if you look even at our own institutions, so like I'm Catholic, all of us I think are Catholic on this call, uh, the Catholic Church failed in our schools. I mean, we had, if you like, we, we were the envy of any kind of Marxian socialist plan uh, to infiltrate children. We'll just set up a massive school system, right? And instead of us actually training people in Catholicism and training people about, say, um, you know, political theory and political philosophy and how to think clearly. What, one third of American Catholics have left the church since the 1960s. The Pew Research says most people stop predicting their Catholicism uh, when they get into college. Uh, you know, we, we've we kind of squandered our own resources too. And I think um, we have to, we have to, so this is a little bit different from what you're saying, Eric, but I mean, I think it's, we have to build associations that actually educate people and not just assume that you know the culture will take care of. It. Otherwise, we're going to get assimilated. And I think we just got assimilated. And I think some of the thematic frustration is like we have to fight and against this uh, you know this assimilation. But again, do that without alienating people who don't like vax mandates but don't agree with you on say national uh, industrial policy. Like build a better coalition. I think we need in a sense a, a coalition that's really grounded in the American tradition. And in the Christian tradition, in a way that I think they're just not pulling off, it seems to me. I mean, I just, it's just like if Patanin, you know, is throwing the American founding under the bus, it's no wonder that conservative Catholics who are worried about the culture are like, well, we better become integralists now, you know? I mean, it's no wonder if there's no tradition. I think Hazoni, I think, was in a sense walking back some of the national conservative uh, thumos in this last talk. I mean, I think he was trying to be conciliatory and bring people on board uh, to address this. But anyway, I, there's so much to talk about. But I do think the good thing is they are bringing up some really interesting uh, questions and they are questioning how we're going to address the real cultural battle that we're in because I don't think there's a place. Like the last thing I'll say is neutrality is a myth, okay? Neutrality is a myth. The secularism is not neutral. Um there's always a vision of the human person and a vision of the good life behind any policy. Um, and so that's good. I do think, as, I, as I'll, we can talk another time, I think they are confusing that with impartiality and justice, right? Impartiality and justice is one thing. That's actually not a neutral position. It comes out of the biblical tradition. Uh, but neutrality is not good. And I think that, in a sense, a lot of conservatives have just kind of hoped like if we have a, a a public square that's reasonably neutral, everything will work itself out at the end. And I think the facts are we've seen that the left is not allowing that. We're in a serious battle. That's the good part of the NatCons. The negative part, I think, is industrial policy stuff, larger state, and just too much punisher enemy language. Dan, am I getting that wrong? What do you think? I mean, <clears throat> I think the problem is, is – I think what these folks, many of these folks want is a political movement. And um, we, have, we have institutions in the United States that are very good at winning elections. They are called the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And I think it is fine for folks to get involved with those, to try to organize political coalitions and the rest of it. <clears throat> I I don't know. I think I think the ideological confusion just frustrates that project, and I think it I think it just alienates people. There was a piece uh, that came out um, shortly before, uh, or just as the conference was beginning, by Sora Bermari and the American Conservative, in which he it was, the headline is "After the Liberalism Debates," and he's basically like, "I don't want to argue about liberalism anymore." I want to do politics. And I think um, that's somewhat disingenuous because <laughs> Amari is somebody who instigated and used these debates to raise his own profile. But I think it's telling that now um, 
now that he has a bigger audience and a bigger stage, he sees these debates as counterproductive. Um, so you even have leading figures that are sort of like, let's just do politics. Let's not do the ideology anymore. And I think that's, I think that's where this ends up. I think this ends up as, you know, there's a lot of intellectual energy. There's a lot of, a lot of Thumos deployed, but it eventually gets dissipated into politics and political activism. And this is where, you know, the sort of universal consensus, who did people look to as a model in this conference? Um, Chris Rufo. And mobilizing grassroots political action in, on school boards. Um, he is in many ways was, was held up as the example um, for this. And this is something that's very close it's much more close to political activism than it is making a historical argument about liberalism. Um, and I think, I think it's, I think this is, this is going, these energies are going to be distilled into politics in that I don't think, I think the ideological thing is, is of secondary importance, even to many of the proponents of national conservatism. Just real quick, how does that fit into your, your your view? I mean, in a sense, it's like it's almost like it's exit in voice, right? And then it's it's not going into Harvard and trying to get that. It's it's building new associations, new grassroots movements, which is which is a you know in a sense, it's like an active Benedict option, right? I mean, right? It's ba- it's baking backing out. How, how, what do you think about about that? Yeah, I, I I don't have a particular problem with politics qua politics and trying to form political movements. I think that makes absolute sense. Uh, the the problem, I guess, is the the orientation of the way they framed their own debate. Right, that this is national conservatism, as if the implication there to me is quite clearly that there's a vision there for the entire nation, which is something that I just reject in toto. There is a vision for the existence of the United States of America and a separation of powers. And, you know, the I, I, from to borrow from Jonah Goldberg's argument with regard to the integralists, which is, you know, OK, I, I'm not in agreement with the integralist project. But let's say before they try to take over the United States, why don't they try to take over Rhode Island? And try to see how much they can implement their vision in Rhode Island and do something on a limited level. Um, so I, I think the the problem for me is always going to be that you're going to have fundamental differences between California and Texas and New York and Michigan and Oklahoma and uh, and and Washington and. The way the best way forward is to let those places be those places, which is, again, the American ideal of a limited federal government and the states and local communities with the ability to solve their problems on the level closest to it. And we have had far too much of an elevation of the problem solving for this country up to the national level. And I just don't hear anything clearly from this movement. And I think the brand that they have embraced, the name that they have chosen for themselves, just seems to indicate that what to me is, if this is a political project, political envy, that they look at what the left has done politically. And instead of objecting to it and saying it's wrong, we have to have some sort of standards, there's kind of this Alinsky envy thing where you say it's like we should just adopt the same tactics ourselves and we should try to get what we want um, at the greatest and highest level possible. That they've created this great expansive power at the federal level and we should try to take it over and we should use it for our purposes. And I think – dark things down – lie down that path. Yeah, I don't don't know. I mean I don't know. I mean – I think there's as Dan, Dan said. I, I mean, there might be some people who think that, uh, but I think a lot of people. I mean, I don't. I don't think Yaram Hosseini is thinking Alinsky envy. I, I, I mean, you know, I think I think I, the level that we're talking about the grassroots uh, kind of stuff. I think there is amongst the populist grassroots part of it been a kind of Alinsky envy, even if they don't know Alinsky, that has kind of seeped into a lot. Do you think, I mean, do you think Chris Rufo thinks that? I mean, it seems to me, I mean, it seems to me, 
Like Chris look, Rufo specifically in the project that he engaged in to take this idea of critical race theory, which has a definition, yeah. and have it come to mean whatever it is that we didn't like. You find the you know you find the thing that's the problem, the person or the idea. You isolate it, you define it, you freeze it. That's straight out of Alinsky. He did a really great job of branding. He did a really great job of making critical race theory mean all of the bad things in education that parents did, were unhappy about and that they didn't like. And I. In a way, I don't begrudge him as a marketer. I don't begrudge him for all of that. But there is, a, to me, a somewhat of an intellectual disingenuousness about saying that, you know, this thing that means something, um, there's certainly elements of critical race theory in yeah. educational curriculums, but it's not the entirety of the problem. He created somewhat of a Rorschach test for everything that people didn't like about the current state of education. To me, that can be, I think you can source that to, in some ways, to... Alinsky's methods. Hmm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know enough to comment on that, but I think on the big picture, I mean, it seems to me that this is what something Dan said. And even like, I don't, I mean, there's a lot of thumos and a lot of talk, you know, spiritedness, I should say spiritedness, like talk, but I don't, I don't, I mean, I think that th right now the, there, I don't know if there's a, a unified vision. I think this is the part, part of thing Dan was talking about. Maybe we can end, Dan. You can. I know you, you, we need to run time, but Dan, you you kind of when you came back and told me about it, like you and you started our conversation this way. That there's a lot of different things going on there, and I think right now um, it's too early to to kind of articulate what it exactly is. I mean, they're trying to they're trying to find something. They're trying to do intellectual entrepreneurship. I mean, wh how would you react to Eric's thing? I mean, it seems to me that's just too too broad of a critique of too many different kinds of people at this point. I don't know. Maybe I'm not, I could be wrong. I just, I, that, I just, it did that Eric's critique seemed a little bit too like monolithic on like, oh, that that's what they're doing. It seems like there's a lot of people doing a lot of different. Well, I'll, I'll even amend to say that's what some people are doing. And there's a lot of people who seem to, in the sense that it is that kind of disparate political coalition with a lot of people involved. There's not a lot of open rejection from people who are identifying themselves as national conservatives of the things that I have a problem with. And I wish I would see more of that. So Dan, let's close out with you. So, <clears throat> I think, I mean, I think what you've got, part of this is, part of this is about a debate of what should the American right be? And the folks at the National Conservative Conference are aware that there's a debate and they want to enter into it. There's also simultaneously another debate going on within national conservatism as to what national conservatism should be. Um, and it gets confusing because those two debates are happening at the same time. Both both are contested. And having gone there, I can I could say that I think that there are probably there are probably people that are very close to where Eric is who identify as national conservatives and who do them for pragmatic and political reasons. And that's where I think this is really a political movement more than it's an ideological movement. There's not that ideological coherence there. There are people with diverse, sometimes conflicting ideological um, commitments there. Um, what there is is a shared desire, shared political desire to sort of um, for a, some sort of right coalition. And there is also a genuine understanding that that right coalition is going to be bigger than any of their ideological points. Hazoni is very specific about this. He says, you know, this is an ideological movement and a political movement, and the political movement is going to be a much bigger tent. And I don't see enough sort of enough of a consistent principal difference for these energies not to be just absorbed into the Republican Party um, for it to have anything long. Now, individual figures, individual thought leaders may have a life on their own independent of that. But in terms of the energy, in terms of its programmatic direction, what Eric said about the Yunkin win is, very, is, is I, think, I think, very true. There's a lot of ways in which Yunkin is very much a sort of Mitt Romney figure who they would recoil at aside from the fact that he won and that he um, 
ran on some issues that they were interested in. But but the political win, the political power overrides any of that, any ideological hesitancy. So that that's that's where I would leave it with that. We should have some of them come on to the Acton podcast and talk about it. We should look into that, absolutely. But let's, for today, call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Acton Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes for a link to where you can subscribe directly to Acton Unwind or just search Acton Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, please, so that more people can find this program. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to Michael for the Acton Institute. This is Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.